All right, welcome back everyone. Welcome back to week seven. I hope you had a good flex week. Um, you know, whatever you did, I hope you had a bit of more time to enjoy yourself, even though you were probably spending a lot of that time on assignments and stuff, and revising. But, you know, hopefully you had a bit of fun during flex week. Okay, so what are we going to do this week? So, you know, during the past few weeks, we've been looking at our graphs topic, right? And we've looked at a couple of um, graph traversal methods. And then what did we go through on Wednesday? We, on Thursday, we went through some graph problems. And we also started looking at directed and weighted graphs, right? So this week, we're going to finish up our topic of graphs. And we're going to start by looking at di uh, digraph algorithms, so algorithms on directed graphs. Um, then in the second half of this lecture, we'll look at Dijkstra's algorithm, which is an algorithm for finding the shortest path on a weighted graph. And then on Thursday, we'll look at minimum spanning tree algorithms. And we'll also talk a little bit about assignment two. All right, so assignment two will release about an hour after the lecture is over today. Uh, just like Sam one. Okay, so let's start by looking at digraph algorithms. Okay, so let's um, do a little reminder of directed graphs. Right, what is a directed graph? A directed graph is a graph where each edge has a direction. Right, so each edge has a source v and a destination w. Right. And in a directed graph, sometimes you can have self loops, right? So where a edge goes from a vertex to itself. Um, but the main point is that unlike undirected graphs, even though you might have an edge from V to W, that doesn't mean you have an edge from W to V, okay? Cool, so we also saw a bunch of applications of directed graphs on um, Thursday. So here are just some. Right? For example, we know that the internet is just a giant directed graph, right? Where our vertices are web pages and our edges represent links, right? From one web page to another. Okay, so that's one application. Then there are other applications like you know chess, where each vertex represents a board state and each edge represents a move between two states and other applications like scheduling, uh, programs where your vertices are functions, uh, journals, so academic journals, where your vertices are articles and your edges are citations, and also make is another example of a directed graph, right, where each target or each executable has a set of dependencies. So you could say that there is an edge from each target to each of its dependencies. Okay, so the first kind of digraph algorithm that we're going to talk about briefly is just digraph traversal. Right, so it turns out that in order to traverse a directed graph, undirected graph, um, it's the same as for a directed graph. Right, so for example, with this BFS here, you know, it's pretty much exactly the same as traversing an undirected graph. Right, so we create a visited array, we mark the starting vertex as visited, but then we enqueue the vertex. And then while the queue is not empty, remember the queue stores all the vertices that have yet to be visited, right? So we store, so while the queue isn't empty, uh, we remove a vertex from the queue, then for each of its neighbors. So in the case of directed graphs, it's for each edge starting from the vertex that we just dequeued, right? So for each edge v, w, uh, if the vertex hasn't been visited, then we mark it as visited and then we enqueue it. Okay, so that's how BFS works. And then with DFS, um, here is the recursive version of DFS. So notice that we have a recursive helper function here, but before we actually call it, we set up our visited array and then we call our recursive function and pass down the visited array and the starting vertex. Okay, so, and of course you could also implement this using a stack 
uh, but here's just the recursive version. Okay, so again, same as for an undirected graph. Right, so here's an application of traversing a directed graph. Right? So the application is web crawling. Right? So what is web crawling? So web crawling is when you use a program in order to you know, look at so a subset of the web, right? so a subset of the internet. So you start off at a particular web page, and then you use your program to locate all the links on that web page, and then you follow those links to go to other web pages, and so on, until you, know, you decide to stop. Right? So why might you want to do this? Um, so search engines need to perform web crawling, right? So you know, how search engines work is that they you know, store a subset of the web in their databases, right? And in order to make sure that the content is kept up to date, every so often the web, uh, the web crawler needs to be run, right? In order to make sure that you have a more recent version of the web page. Right, so search engines need to do web crawling, um, and then, yeah, and they do it also to perform indexing. So what search engines will do is they will look through web pages and then identify the keywords, right, so that when you search for something, um, they can quickly identify which pages have the keywords that you searched for, right, so that's indexing. And then also, yeah, web crawlers, they do need to cache, or search engines, they need to cache web pages locally. Okay, so which traversal method is more appropriate for a web crawler? <laughs> right, so suppose that we want to, you know, we, we're starting off at a web page that has some information on data structures, right? So let's say we start off a particular web page on data structures, and suppose we want to crawl starting from that web page, but we want web pages that are similar in content or in topic to data structures, right? So, which traversal method would be more appropriate here, BFS or DFS? What do you guys think? So who thinks BFS is more appropriate? Okay, a lot of people. Yeah, so it is BFS, right? And the reason is that BFS does, um, so remember what BFS is from two weeks ago, right? It's where you favor your neighbors over path following or pretty much your visiting vertices or web pages in order of distance from the starting vertex. Right, so meanwhile, how does DFS work? DFS just follows a path as far as it can until it reaches a dead end, right? Or, yeah, and once it reaches a dead end, it's gonna backtrack and then repeat the process. So DFS, since you're just following one link at each point, right, as far as you can, it's more likely that you're going to get to a page that is completely unrelated to your data structures really quickly, right? So, for example, suppose you start out on a Wikipedia page, right? If you follow a bunch of pages, right, you might end up on a very different topic, right? So let's suppose you start off at a page about data structures and then, like, at some point you end up clicking on the name, right? And then from that person's article, you end up on a different page and so on. So, yeah. Meanwhile, if you use BFS, right, um, all of the links on the initial page are very likely to be similar to data structures, right? Or have a similar topic. So you're going to reach more of those pages which are similar to what we're interested in, which is data structures. Okay, so, right, so that's an example of um, traversing a directed graph. Right? And the thing with web crawling is that we can't really use a visited array, right? Because remember, a visited array has you know, one entry for each vertex, 
But when we're web crawling, we don't know how many web pages there are, right? So what we would need to do is to store a set of all the web pages that we visited so far, right? Instead of having a zero or one for each possible, you know, web page on the internet. Okay. Cool, and here is an example of BFS, right? To perform web crawling. So you create a visited set, and then you add your starting URL to the visited set, and then you perform breadth first search, basically, right? And while you're doing this, you know, you, maybe you don't wanna um, store all the possible pages on the internet, right? Because you might not have enough memory in your database for that. So um, maybe you would keep track of how many pages you've visited so far, and once you've hit the limit, then you stop. Right? So, yeah. Okay, so let us go on to the next algorithm. All right, so the next one that we want to talk about is cycle checking. Right, so, so through this, hopefully we'll see that cycle checking is kind of a tricky task, um, especially for directed graphs, right? But also for undirected graphs, we saw that it was pretty tricky. We went through a couple of iterations of uh, wrong approaches. Right, so let's see how we perform cycle checking in a directed graph. Right, so remember that a cycle is a directed path so in the case of directed graphs, a cycle is a direct path where the starting vertex is the same as the end vertex. Okay, so in this graph over here, we have three different cycles. Right, so the first one is 0, 4, 0. Right, so notice that in a directed graph, these two edges are considered to be different, right? unlike an undirected graph where every graph is bidirectional, so we can't go back and forth along the same edge. Right, so 0, 4, 0 here is considered to be a cycle. Uh, 2, 5, 6, 2 is considered to be a cycle. And also uh, this self loop here at vertex 3, we consider that to form a cycle. Okay. So these are the cycles. And remember what our cycle checking algorithm was from few weeks ago, right, this is how we did it. Right, so here is the, you know, the main function for checking if there's a cycle. So we create a visited array, and then for each vertex in the graph, right, if the vertex hasn't been visited before, then we call our helper function, our recursive helper function starting from that vertex, and if we find the cycle, then we return true. Right, and the purpose of this for loop was to make sure that we actually check every component of the graph, right? Because if the graph has multiple components, if the component that you start at doesn't have a cycle, then you might want to check the other components as well. All right, and how did this recursive helper function work? So at the start, we mark the current vertex as visited, right? And then for each neighbor of the vertex, right? So for each edge of VW, Remember that we didn't want to count an edge if it goes back to the vertex that we just came from. So if W is equal to the previous vertex, then we continue. That means we go back to the beginning of the loop. If W has already been visited, then that means there is a cycle. Right? Otherwise, we check if there is a cycle from vertex W, right? And we pass in vertex V as the previous vertex. Okay, and then if we've checked every neighbor and there is no cycle, we return false. Okay, so the question is, does this work for directed graphs? Right, and does anyone have any ideas? And the answer is on the slide, so you know, if you've seen it then. So, the answer is no, it doesn't work. Right? And why it doesn't work? Um, because if we look at the example graph over here, right, suppose we started off at vertex zero. Right? Now, we're expecting to find a cycle 
from going to four and then back to zero, right? The problem is since we're keeping track of the previous vertex as we are traversing the graph, right? When we recurse over the vertex four, zero is going to be the previous vertex. And then we're not going to count this edge going back to zero, right? Because it's going back to a vertex that we've already seen before. Oh, it's going back to the previous vertex, right? So, so we wouldn't end up finding this cycle, right? So that's the first problem, right? So how do we fix that? Well, we just don't ignore the edge to the previous vertex, right? So if at any point there is an edge to a vertex that we've already visited, then we conclude that there is a cycle, right? So here is the implementation of cycle checking from last Thursday, right? So notice that here we have an if statement checking that if the neighbor of our current vertex is the same as our previous vertex, right? And if it was, then we continue, right? Which means we ignore the edge, right? So in order to deal with this problem, let's actually get rid of this check. Or before we do that, let me show you that this doesn't work. Okay, so in the tests folder, right, I have a graph here, which just has two vertices and each vertex has an edge to the other vertex, right? So we have an edge from zero to one and an edge from one to zero, okay? So now, if I compile this and run it, right, it's going to say that there is no cycle, right? Even though it should say that there is a cycle. Right, another example of a graph is this one, right, where there is just one vertex and there is an edge from a ver the vertex to itself, right, from zero to zero. Now, there should be a cycle here, but when we run the program, it's gonna say that there is not a cycle, okay? Okay, and the reason for that is that when we initially called our recursive helper function, we're passing the vertex itself, right, as the previous vertex. And we did this because in an undirected graph, usually you don't have a self-loop. Right? But uh, we could have self-loops in a directed graph. So in order to fix this, let's change our function so that it doesn't um, ignore the edge to the previous vertex. All right, so first we'll get rid of this argument previous. And get rid of this arguments. Okay, so we'll get rid of this. And we'll also get rid of this if statement. All right. And when we call our function recursively, we're just not going to pass it v. Okay, so we need to compile. And now when we run it, on our first graph, it should say that there is a cycle, right? Because there's a cycle, zero, one, zero. And when we give it our second graph, where there is just a self-loop at vertex zero, it should say that there is a cycle as well. Okay, so, and we have some other tests here. Let's see what cycle three is. Okay, so, so let's have a look at this one. So we have three vertices, right? And then we have an edge from zero to one, then one to two, and from zero to two, right? So in this graph, there is no cycle, right? So is this going to work? So it should say that there is no cycle, right? But our implementation says that there is, right? So there is still a problem with our solution. Right, so here is our new version of our cycle checking algorithm. And unfortunately, it still doesn't work because of that test case that I just showed you. Okay, so what's the problem with this one? So the problem 
is because of the graph being directed, right? And here is an example of the case that I just showed you. So we have three vertices, an edge from zero to one, an edge from one to two, and an edge from zero to two. Right, so why does our algorithm detect that there is a cycle? Um, well, if we start at vertex zero, right, then we're going to recurse into vertex one, then we're going to recurse into vertex two, right, and we're going to mark both of these vertices as visited. Right? The problem is when we're at vertex two, we're going to backtrack right back to vertex zero because it's a dead end, right? So we're going to backtrack to vertex zero. And then from vertex zero, we're going to look at this edge from zero to two. Right? And since vertex two has already been visited, um, it's going to say that there is a cycle, right? So, so that's a problem with our algorithm. Right? So, in order to see, you know, how we can try and um, s detect cycles in a directed graph, um, let's have a look at an example on an undirected graph, right? So maybe we can try and glean a different method from this. All right, so here is just the graph from before, except it's undirected, right? And we want to perform a cycle check on this graph, starting from vertex zero, right? So so in this function, we're going to you know, keep track of the previous vertex again, because this is an undirected graph. Right, and here is the core stack, and here is the visited array. Right, nice and simple, just three vertices. So what are we going to do? Uh, well, since there is an edge from 0 to 1, we're going to recurse into vertex 1. Right, so now the core stack is going to have this function call in it, where the current vertex is 1 and the previous vertex is 0 and we're going to mark one as visited. Right, then, since there is an edge from one to two, right, we're going to recurse into vertex two. Right, and now the core stack is gonna have cycle two on it, and the previous vertex is gonna be one, and we're going to mark two as visited. Right. And from two, what are we gonna do? Well, since there is an edge from two back to zero, we conclude that there is a cycle, right? Because zero has already been visited. Right? So we conclude that there is a cycle and that's the right answer. Okay, so we can see that when we actually detect the cycle right, in the graph, the vertex that we're going back to, which is vertex zero, right, it's, it's already on the core stack. Right, so we started by calling cycle zero, then we called cycle one, then we called cycle two, and then when we detect the cycle, we're going back to a vertex that's already on the core stack. Right? And that's another way of detecting if there is a cycle on, uh, in an undirected graph. Right? So the way we actually detected this in our original cycle checking um, was to use the visited array, right? So if zero was already visited, then there's a cycle. Um, but it turns out that this method doesn't work for directed graphs, right? So what we're going to do this time is, in order to detect the cycle, we're going to check if the neighbor that we're going back to is already on the core stack, right? So if the neighbor is on the core stack, then we'll say that there is a cycle. Um, otherwise, um, we're going to keep checking. Okay, so what we need is a separate array. So now we need two arrays, a visited array, and another array to keep track of whether a vertex is on the core stack or not. Okay, so here is the pseudocode for this. So at the beginning of the function, we create two arrays, a visited array and an on stack array to keep track of whether a vertex is on the stack or not. Then um, we're going to loop through each vertex again. For each vertex, we check if there is a cycle. Right? And again, the point of this is to make sure that we cover each component of the graph if there are multiple. Okay, so how does our 
recursive helper function work. So at the beginning of the function, we're going to mark vertex v as visited, right, just like before. But we're also going to set v as being on the stack. Right? So we're going to uh, mark the vertex as being on the core stack. And notice that at, notice at the end of the function, we're going to set that back to false. Right? So when the function backtracks, um, we're going to, you know, well, the vertex isn't going to be on the core stack anymore. So we're going to set it back to false. Right? And inside this loop where we check for neighbors, if W, so remember before we checked that if W was visited, right, then we would return true because there is a cycle. Right here, we're going to check if W is on the core stack. Right, If W is on the stack, then we're going to return true. Um, otherwise, we're going to keep checking. Right? So we're going to recurse into the neighbor and keep checking the rest of the graph. Okay, so let's try and update our function so that it uses this approach. Right, so first thing we're gonna have to do is to pass through an array to keep track of whether a vertex is on the core stack or not. Then we're going to, in our cycle function, we're going to allocate a new array. Right, and we're going to pass that into our helper function. Okay, then at the beginning of our recursive helper function, we're going to mark v as being on the stack. Okay, so on stack v equals true. And now in our if statements, uh, so while we're checking all of our neighbors, Instead of checking if W has been visited, we're gonna check if W is on the stack. Right, so if W is on the stack, then we return true. Otherwise, we're going to just recurse into that vertex. If the vertex hasn't been visited yet. Right, so if W hasn't been visited, then we recurse into W. And if there's a cycle from that point, then we return true, okay? Otherwise, we're going to set w, or set v, sorry, back to not being on the stack, right? Then return false. Okay, so let's compile this. And first, let's check that it still works on our first few test cases. Okay, so cycle one should say that there is a cycle. Cycle two should say that there is a cycle. And this time, cycle three should say that there is no cycle. Right? So this test case over here. Right? And the reason it says that there is no cycle this time um, is because, let's go back to this graph. Right? When we backtrack from zero, it's gonna set on stack two back to false. Right? So that way, when we are all the way back at vertex zero, when we're checking vertex two, right, because there's an edge from zero to two, two is not going to be on the stack anymore, okay? Cool, so let's check now. So we have a few more test cases. So cycle four, so cycle four is this next example over here. All right, so so where so if we want to check if a cycle exists in this graph, right? How do we? You know, how is the algorithm going to work? If we start from vertex zero, um, then first of all it's going to head over to vertex one, right? And then vertex one is a kind of dead end, so it's going to backtrack, right? Then it's going to go to vertex two, right? From vertex two. When it sees vertex one, right, it shouldn't say that there is a cycle, right? Because again, vertex one isn't on the stack anymore. We already returned from it, right? So we're going to head over to vertex three. Um, then from vertex three, we're going to head over to vertex four. From vertex four, head over to vertex five. From vertex five, 
we're going to see an edge back to vertex two. And this time, since vertex two is on the stack still, right? So the stack, uh, the core stack at this point is zero, two, three, four, five, right? So since two is still on the core stack, it should detect a cycle right? and return true. All right, so that's this graph over here. So maybe I can add some print statements to this to show what's going on. Okay, so at the end of the function, what I'll do is print backtracking from vertex v. Okay, so we'll just show when we're backtracking and we'll also show when we recurse into vertex v. Okay, and then when we detect a cycle, I'm going to just print out that we found a cycle. Found a cycle going from v to w. Okay, so first of all, let's try and run it on the first few test cases. Okay, so, oops, this should be a redirection. Right, so we recurse into zero, recurse into one, then we find the cycle going back from one to zero. Right, and for cycle two, right, we find the cycle going from zero to zero because there was a loop. Right, now for our fourth test case where there is a cycle. Right, so notice what's happening here. Right, remember, here is the graph. Right, so we recurse into vertex zero, then we recurse into vertex one. Right, but since there is a dead end, we're going to backtrack from vertex one back to zero. Then we recurse into two, three, four, five, and then we find a cycle going from five to two. So that's just showing how that works. Okay, so that's cycle checking. So does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so if not, uh, we'll look at our next kind of concept related to directed graphs, uh, which is transitive closure. Okay, so a common problem in directed graphs is we want to know which vertices are reachable from a particular vertex. Right, so reachability is the problem that we often want to solve. Right, and unlike an undirected graph, with a directed graph, it's kind of difficult to compute reachability. Right, because think about it, with an undirected graph, how do we figure out if two vertices are reachable from each other? Well, we can simply compute the connected components of the graph, right? Because remember that in a connected component, right, there is always going to be a path between two vertices in that component. Right? So you can compute connected components. And then, you know, if you want to check if V and W are reachable from each other, then you can just check if they're in the same components. Right. Yeah, so I'm actually watching the, the live stream chat right now. So, and yeah, and if there are any questions, I will answer them. So yeah, I'm doing double duty today. Um, but yeah, so with a directed graph, reachability is kind of a more difficult question to answer, right? Because, because first of all, you don't really have connected components anymore. Right? And if there is a path from S to T, um, that doesn't mean that there is a path from T to S. Right? So even though T might be reachable from S, that doesn't mean S might be reachable from T. So how might we compute reachability? Right? So one way is to just use a BFS or a DFS, right? starting at vertex S. Right, so that's the kind of obvious way of doing it. So is there a path from S to T? Well, just do a DFS or BFS starting from S, right? 
And if you visit T during that traversal, then you know that there is a path, right? So this would just be O of B plus E in the worst case. Right, so the problem is what happens if we need to do this a lot, right? So we're given lots of different pairs of vertices and we want to check for reachability, right? Do we want to perform a graph traversal every time we get this kind of request or query? Well, not necessarily, right? Because it might be really inefficient. So, so one idea now is before we actually get all of these queries, we're going to pre-process the graph, right? So that we have a V by V matrix that tells us if there is a path from S to T, right? For every possible pair of vertices, S, T. Okay, so V by V matrix. Now, uh, row S and column T is going to tell us if there is a path from S to T or not. Right. And this is what's called the transitive closure. Right. So the transitive closure matrix um, is just another name for the reachability matrix. Okay, so here is an example of a reachability matrix or transitive closure matrix. Right. So here's a graph and here's the adjacency matrix for that graph. Right. First of all, notice that this matrix isn't symmetric, right? Because it's a directed graph, right? So, for example, we have an edge from zero to six, so there's a one over here, but there is no edge from six to zero, right? So there is no one over here. Okay, and here is the reachability matrix, right? That tells us if there is a path from A to B or not. All right. So notice that. In the reachability matrix, there is a path from six to zero, right? And if you look at the graph, you can figure out what that path is, right? So you go six, one, zero, right? And there's your path, all right? Here's another example. So for example, there is no edge from four to zero, right? So the adjacency matrix tells us that, but there is a path from four to zero, right? where you have to go four, six, one, zero. Right, there's your path. Okay, so what we wanna do is to compute this reachability matrix. Right, so one way you might do it is to just perform a BFS or DFS starting from every vertex, right? And you know, that will surely tell you um, what is reachable, right? So, we had a question of where was the path from one to three in this graph? So there is no path from one to three and there's a zero in this cell over here. So that tells us that there is no path. Yeah, and if you look at the graph, I don't think there is a way to get from one to three. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, we could perform BFS or DFS from every vertex and compute the reachability matrix that way. Um, but another really simple, elegant way of doing it is called Walshaw's algorithm, right? And this algorithm doesn't require graph traversal. And also, um, it's also possible for it to not use any extra memory. So it's possible for it to use O1 memory, right? Which is really cool. So how does Walshaw's algorithm actually work? Right, so here is the idea that it's based on. Okay, so the way it checks if there's a path is we know that there is a path from S to T if, first of all, if there is an edge from S to T, right? If there is an edge from S to T, then surely there's a path. Um, or there is a path from S to T via vertex zero, right? So if there's a path that goes S zero T, then that means there's a path or there's a path from S to T via vertex zero and or one, right? So if there's a path that goes S zero one T, S one zero T or S one T, then that also means there's a path from S to T and um, or so on, right? So if there's a path from S to T via zero one or two or so on, right? And 
in Walshaw's algorithm, how it works is it computes every, every iteration of the algorithm, it computes um, the next dot points, right? So it starts off by knowing that there's a path if there's an edge. In the first iteration, it checks or it finds all the paths where there is only vertex zero in the middle of the path, right? In the second iteration, it finds all the paths where there are only vertices zero and one in the middle of the path, and so on. Right, so here is an example of how that works. Right, so here is our initial graph, right, and we want to compute reachability. Right, so eventually, we want to create an edge between S and T if there is a path between S and T. Right, so first of all, there is a path from S to T if there is an edge from S to T. Right, so this is kind of the default. So there is obviously a path if there is an edge. Um, or there is a path from S to T via vertex 0. Right, so notice that there is a path from 1 to 2 via vertex 0. So we're going to add this edge to our graph. Or there is a path from S to T via vertex 0 and or 1. Right, so these are the new paths that we found based on this, uh, this statement over here. Right, so for example, notice that there is a path from 3 to 0 via vertex 1, right? 3, 1, 0. And there is also a path from 3 to 2 via vertices 0 and 1, right? Because there's a path 3, 1, 0, 2. Okay, and there is a path from 3 to itself because you can go 3, 1, 3. Okay. Or there is a path from S to T via vertices 0, 1, and 2. In this case, um, we don't have any additional paths based on this because 2 itself doesn't actually have any outgoing edges. Right? So it's not really useful here. Um, or there's a path from S to T via 0, 1, 2, and or 3. Right? So from this rule, uh, we figure that there's a path from 1 to itself because we can get from 1 to 3 back to 1. Okay, so that's the idea of the algorithm. And it's really clever. And once I show you the code, it's going to be um, even nicer, so even more elegant. So how the algorithm works is at each, remember that, at each iteration, it's going to calculate a new set of paths just by adding one extra vertex, by allowing one extra vertex to be in the middle of the path. Right? So initially, it only allows vertex 0. Right? In the next iteration, it adds on vertex 1. So it's going to allow vertex 1. In the next iteration, it's going to allow vertex 2 to be in the middle, and so on. Right? Every iteration, it just adds on one extra vertex. All right, so the way it works is that on the kth iteration, right, the algorithm is going to check. So it's going to check if there's a path between S and T using just these vertices, right? Just the vertices from 0 to K, right? So I think I already described that on the previous slides. Um, but here is just another diagram. So on the kth iteration, right, what the algorithm has already done is it knows if there is a path from S to K and a path from K to T using only the vertices from 0 to K minus 1. Right? So if there is a path from S to K and a path from K to T using vertices from 0 to K minus 1 in the middle of these paths, then that means there is a path from S to T, right? Using vertices from 0 to K, right? And here is the if statement in the algorithm that is used to check that, right? So if there is a path from S to K and there is a path from K to T, then there is a path from S to T, okay? And here is the pseudocode for that algorithm. 
right? And it's so, so simple, right? The only thing we do is at the start, we create a copy of our adjacency matrix, okay? And then for each vertex K in G, so we're looping from zero to N minus one as our outer loop, right? So this is each of the iterations that we were talking about. What we're gonna do is loop through every pair of vertices, S and T, and if there's a path from S to K and a path from K to T, then there is a path from S to T, right? This is just the if statement that I showed on the previous slide. Okay, so very, very elegant. Okay, so let's look at an um, example of this algorithm in action. Okay, so here's just the same graph as before, and we want to find the transitive closure. Okay, so what we're going to do is first we're going to just create a copy of the adjacency matrix of the graph. Right, so for this algorithm to work, you need to actually create an adjacency matrix. Right? Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be as efficient. So anyway, we first create a copy of the adjacency matrix. Right, so this is going to contain the edges of the original graph. Right, so 0 to 2, 1 to 3, um, 1 to 0, and 3 to 1. Right, so in the first iteration, k is equal to 0. Right? So we're going to try and use k as an intermediate vertex, right? so the vertex in the middle of the path. So we see that while we're looping through the matrix, that there is a path from 1 to 0 and a path from 0 to 2. So what that tells us is that there is a path from one to two, right? So we add this one to our matrix. So there's a path from one to two. And that's it for the first iteration, right? Because zero has no more incoming edges and zero doesn't have any more outgoing edges. Right? So in the next iteration, K is equal to one. Right? So what do we do now? Right, first, we see that there is a path from 3 to 1 and a path from 1 to 0. Right, so, that there, so that means that there is a path from 3 to 0. Right, so we put the 1 into our matrix. All right. Next, there is a path from 3 to 1 and a path from 1 to 2. Right, so remember that the path from 1 to 2, we just calculated in the previous iteration. Right? This is what we just calculated. So now we're kind of using this path right, in the second iteration. So there's a path from three to one and a path from one to two. That means that there is a path from three to two, okay? Um, and finally, there is a path from three to one and a path from one to three. So that tells us that there is a path from three to itself, right? So we put a one over here, okay? So that's it for the second iteration. Now, in the third iteration, k is going to be equal to 2. Right? Uh, but since there is no outgoing edge from vertex 2, um, that means we don't actually find any additional paths. Right? So there aren't any extra paths that go via 2. Right? Because, again, 2 doesn't have any outgoing edges. So. So this iteration, we don't really find anything. Uh, in the fourth iteration, though, where k equals to 3, right, we see that 3 has, or well, we see that there is a path from 1 to 3, and we see that there is a path from 3 to 1. Right? So that tells us that there is a path from 1 to itself. Okay, so we put a 1 over here, and, and that's the end of the fourth iteration. Okay, so, so yeah, and that's the end of the algorithm, right? Because we've now gone through all of the four vertices, right? And I'm just um, drawing the edges here to show you which edges were part of the original graph, right? And which edges, or which paths we ended up finding through this algorithm.
Okay, so what's the end time complexity of our algorithm? So first of all, um, we can clearly see that the algorithm is you know, O of V cubed. Right, so it's quite simple to see because we have three very simple loops, right, nested loops, that just iterate through every vertex of the graph. Right, so O of V cubed. Now the space complexity depends on whether you actually create a copy of the adjacency matrix or not. Right, so if you create a copy of the matrix, then it's going to be you know, O of V squared. Right. If you're just taking the original matrix and you're just modifying it, which you can also do, then the algorithm doesn't take any extra memory. Right, so it's just O1 space. Right, so the time complexity is O of V cubed, so you know, it's quite inefficient, uh, but the benefit is that now you're able to compute reachability in O1 time right, for every possible pair of vertices in the graph. Um, so this trade-off might be worth it if you have an application that needs to compute reachability a lot. Okay, so that is Washel's algorithm. Right. And that's the last kind of directed graph algorithm that I wanted to talk about. Right. But there are lots of other algorithms um, on directed graphs that you could um, look at yourself if you're curious. So on Thursday in week five, we looked at connected components, right, I think, on undirected graphs. Right, with directed graphs, there is a concept called strongly connected components, right, where you have you know, subsets of vertices that can all be reached from each other. Right, so that's a strongly connected component. And there are a bunch of algorithms that you can use to uh, compute these. And you know, since we've deemed these to be too hard, we're not going to cover them, but you could have a look at them yourself. I mean, just look at their names, right? Kosaraju's algorithm, Taijan's algorithm, you know, they sound difficult. So yeah, we're not covering these. Um, but you know, that's it for this topic. Um, and yeah, thank you for the few people who actually submitted feedback you know, last time. So, um, you know, keep them coming. I like to hear feedback. If there's anything you think we could change or improve, um, even anything you liked, um, it's always nice to get feedback. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll take a five minute break. And once we come back, we'll look at Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so back in five minutes.
Okay, so let's start back again. So in this part of the lecture, we're going to be looking at a special algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. Right, but first we'll look at what is a shortest path in relation to weighted graphs, right, and then see the motivation for using the algorithm in the first place. Okay, so remember, let's remind ourselves what is a path in the context of a weighted graph, right? So a path is a sequence of edges, right, connected end to end. So here is an example of a path, and in a weighted graph, we have the idea of the cost of a path, right? Because the edges themselves might have different weights. So the cost of a path is going to be the sum of the weights of the edges along the path, right? So weight one plus weight two plus blah, 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 plus weight M. Okay, and the shortest path between two vertices, S and T, is the path with the minimum cost, right? The path between them with minimum cost. Okay, so there are different shortest path problems. And so here are some examples. So we have the source target shortest path problem. So in this kind of problem, we wanna find, so we're given two vertices and we wanna find the shortest path just between them, right? Just between those two vertices. Okay, we also have a problem called the single source shortest path. Right, so in this problem, we're given a starting vertex S and we just wanna find the shortest path from S to all other vertices. Okay, and we also have something called the all pairs shortest path problem where we are not given any vertices, we're just given a graph and we wanna find the shortest path between or pairs of vertices, right? So different shortest path problems and there are different algorithms that can be used to solve these, right? But of course, the one that we're going to talk about is Dijkstra's algorithm, right? So the reason why we need a special algorithm to find the shortest path in a weighted graph is that in a weighted graph, a path that has more edges might be shorter than a path with fewer edges, right? So here is an example of a graph where that's the case, right? So suppose we want to find the shortest path from zero to one, right? Well, if we just do a, you know, BFS, then the path we would get is just zero one, right? Because this is the path with the fewest edges. But since this is a weighted graph, the shortest path is actually this path from zero to two to one, right? This path over here from zero to two to one costs four, whereas the path that just takes the straight edge from zero to one costs five, right? Another example is a path from zero to three, right? So we have a path from zero to two to three that costs four, which has two edges, right? But there's another path that takes three edges, which is actually shorter, right? Zero, four, five, three, costs three. Okay, so, so in order to actually find the shortest path in the weighted graph, we need a special algorithm, um, and one such algorithm is called Dijkstra's algorithm. Right, so invented by Dijkstra in 1956. Right, and Dijkstra's algorithm is a single source shortest path algorithm. Right, so it's used to find the shortest path from vertex S to all the vertices. But of course, if you're given two vertices and you wanna find the shortest path between them, then it can also be used as a source target shortest path algorithm. Okay. Okay, and there are a couple of important constraints on Dijkstra's algorithm, right? So the main one is that the path has non-negative weights. Right. If your path has negative weights, then Dijkstra's algorithm might not work. Okay, so what are the data structures that we use in Dijkstra's algorithm? Right, we 
also went through this for BFS and DFS. Remember that BFS uses a cube and a visitor array. DFS uses a stack and a visitor array, right? And also a predecessor array. So with Dijkstra's algorithm, we have three main things. First of all, we have a distance array, right? So the distance array tells us the shortest of the cost of the shortest currently known path to each vertex. Right, so the shortest currently known distance, I guess, to each vertex. Right, we will also have a predecessor array, which serves the same purpose as in BFS or DFS. Right, so it just tells us the predecessor of each vertex on the shortest path to that vertex. Right, or actually the shortest path of each vertex on the shortest currently known path. Right, so that's because as we traverse through the graph, we might find shorter and shorter paths, and we're going to be updating these arrays. Okay, and we also have a set of vertices, right? That just contains all the vertices that we haven't explored yet, okay? So, here is the algorithm, right? In English, we'll also look at the pseudocode, um, but What's the algorithm going to do first? Well, it's going to create and initialize these dot structures, right? So first, create a distance array, initialize to infinity, right? So it's infinity because at the beginning of the algorithm, we haven't actually seen any of the vertices yet. So we don't actually know if these vertices are reachable or not, right? So we set all the distances to infinity um, in C, you can't technically set a distance to infinity um, if you're using integers, but you can use int max. Um, so you can just use the largest possible integer. Of course, the, um, the assumption you're making here is that there is no path that actually costs more than int max. Right. So usually that's the case because your edge weights are going to be relatively small. Okay, we also have um, we also have a predecessor array, so we're going to initialize that to minus one, right? Just like we did with BFS and DFS, um, and we're going to initialize our set of vertices to contain all the vertices in the graph. Okay, then what we're going to do is set the distance of the starting vertex to zero. Right, because we know that the distance from a vertex to itself is just zero. It's just an empty path. And now, while the set of vertices is not empty, so here is our kind of main loop, similar to kind of the main loop from BFS and DFS, but while the set of vertices isn't empty, we're going to remove a vertex from the B sets, right, uh, from the vertex sets. And this vertex is going to be the one that has the smallest distance in the distance array. Right, so, we're going to, so out of all of the vertices, we're going to pick the one with the smallest distance and remove it. Right, so this is kind of different from BFS or DFS, where with BFS, we just remove the vertex at the front of the queue. Right, with DFS, we remove the vertex at the top of the stack. In Dijkstra's algorithm, we're going to be a bit more selective and choose the one with the smallest distance. Right? And for this vertex, we're going to explore the vertex. Right? So what that means is for each edge from that vertex, we're going to check if this edge gives us a shorter path to the neighbor W. Right? And this process is called edge relaxation. Right? So if we check this edge from V to W, and if we use this edge, uh, if we're using this edge allows us to get a shorter path to W, then we're going to update W's distance and predecessor. All right, so here is a more detailed explanation of edge relaxation, All right? So during the algorithm, um, the distance and predecessor arrays, they don't contain you know, accurate information, right? They contain the shortest distance and the shortest path found so far, right, to each vertex. Right, so while we're exploring the graph, we're going to need to update these arrays if we find a shorter path right, to each vertex. So 
that's called edge relaxation. And here's an example. So suppose we're considering this edge here from V to W, right? and suppose S is our starting vertex. Right? Now, when we're considering this edge, what we currently have, so the information that we currently have is the length of the shortest known path from S to W, so S to V, right? And we also have the cost of the shortest known path from S to W, right? So we have this distance and we have this distance over here and this distance here might be infinity, right? So maybe we haven't actually seen W before and that means the shortest known path will just be infinity. Okay, so during edge relaxation, what we're gonna do is take this um, path from S to V and extend it using this edge, right? And that's gonna create a new path from S to W, right? And now we have two paths from S to W, right? One that goes via vertex V and one which is the currently known shortest path, right? So we have this shortest known path from S to W, which again might be infinity because we haven't seen W before, and a new path from S to W via V. And we're going to compare these. And if the new path is shorter, then we're going to update our arrays, right? So here is the pseudocode for that. So if the distance from S to V, the shortest distance from S to V, plus the weight of the edge from V to W is less than the current shortest known path from S to W, right, so this W, then we're going to set this W to this V plus weight. So we're going to update our distance array and we're going to update the predecessor of W to V, right? Because now this path is shorter and the predecessor of W is V. Okay, so here are some examples of edge relaxation. So suppose that during Dijkstra's algorithm, um, we want to uh, perform relaxation along this edge from U to W. Right? And suppose that the shortest distance from S to U is five. Right? So in the distance array for U, we have five. And suppose that we haven't actually seen W before. Right, so the distance to W is still infinity. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, the new path, so this path from S to W, if we use this edge, is gonna cost five plus seven, right, which is 12, right? So since we haven't seen W before, right, obviously this new path is going to be shorter than the currently known path, which is infinity, right? So we're going to update the distance to W to 12, right? And we're going to update the predecessor of W to vertex U, right? Because before we relaxed along this edge, the predecessor was minus one because we hadn't seen W before, right? So we update it to U. Okay, so that's one example. Um, now here's another example. So suppose that you know, we continue running the algorithm and we've explored a couple more vertices, right? And we're now looking at this edge over here from V to W, right? And the weight of this edge is three, right? So suppose that we know that the shortest distance from S to V is eight, right? And the shortest distance from S to W is 12, which we had figured out before. Right, now if we use this edge to go from S to W, right, then the cost of this path is gonna be eight plus three, right, which is 11, right? Now since 11 is less than 12, that means we found a shorter path from S to W. So we're going to update our distance to 11 Right, so our distance from S to W is now going to be 11, and the predecessor of W is going to be updated to V. Right? So before it was U, because this was our shortest path, but since we found a shorter path now that goes via V, 
we're going to update the predecessor to v. Okay, so that is some examples of edge relaxation. Right? And here is the pseudocode for Dijkstra's algorithm. Right? So it kind of follows the English description from earlier. Right? So we create our data structures. Then we set the distance to the starting vertex to zero. Then inside our main loop, we're going to find the vertex that's in the vset that is closest to the starting vertex. And then for each edge from that vertex, we're going to relax along that edge. Okay, so here is an example. So let's go through an example of Dijkstra's algorithm. Right, so here we have the graph. Um, here we have the main loop of Dijkstra's algorithm. So we're assuming that all the initialization has already been done. Okay, so we're starting from vertex zero. So all the other distances are infinity and all the predecessors are minus one. Okay, so in the first iteration, right, we're going to remove vertex zero from the vset, right? Because it's the closest vertex to the source, right? Because, the, I mean, the source is vertex zero, but still it is. Um, so we remove zero from the vset. And now we're going to explore zero, right? So look at all the edges from vertex zero. Right now, let's look at them in order. So in ascending order. So first of all, this edge over here, Right, so we're going to relax along this edge 0, 1. Right, now 1 we haven't actually seen before. Right, the distance to 1 is infinity. Right, and if we use this edge, then the distance to 1 is going to be 14. Right, because 0 is our starting point. Right, so the cost to 1 is going to be 14. And since 14 is smaller than infinity, we're going to... Well, so here's the kind of calculation that we do, right? So the distance to zero is zero. If we add the weight of this edge, it's going to be 14. And since this is smaller than infinity, we're going to update our distance and predecessor, right? So the new distance to one is 14, and the new predecessor of one is zero. And we're going to do the same thing for vertices two and three, right? So if we relax along this edge, the new path is going to cost nine, right, which is smaller than infinity. So we're going to update our distance to nine and the predecessor to zero. And same thing for this last edge over here. Right, so the path from zero to three is going to cost seven. So we update our uh, distance and predecessor. Okay, so that's the first uh, iteration. Okay, now in the second iteration, which vertex are we going to remove from the V sets? So which one are we going to remove? So these are the remaining vertices in the V set. Which one should we remove now? Three. Sorry? Three. Yeah, so it's going to be three, right? Because out of these vertices, um, three is the one with the smallest distance. Okay, so we're going to remove three from the vset now, and we're going to explore these three edges. Right, well, first of all, um, it turns out that we don't need to consider this edge over here from 3 to 0. Right, the reason is that 0 has already been explored. And in Dijkstra's algorithm, once you explore an algorithm, um, that means you already know the shortest distance to that vertex. Right, so that shortest distance is finalized. That means you're never going to find a shorter path to it. Right, so um, so you can just ignore this edge. Right now, let's, let's look at the other two edges. 
All right, so if we relax along this edge from 3 to 2, right, the cost to vertex 2 is going to be the distance to 3, the shortest distance to 3 in the distance array, right, plus 10, right, which is the weight of this edge. So 7 plus 10 is going to be 17. And is that shorter than the current shortest known part of 2? Well, the current known shortest part of 2 uh, costs 9, right? So 17 is not smaller than 9, so we don't update anything in our arrays. Okay, now the next edge is from 3 to 5. Right now, if we use this edge over here, the path to 5 is going to cost 7 in the distance array plus 15. Right, so that's going to be 22. Right now, since 22 is more than infinity, we're going to update our arrays. So the new distance to 5 is going to be 22, and the predecessor is going to be 3. Okay, so and now we're done with exploring 3. All right, so next, so we are selecting between 1, 2, 4, and 5, right? So the vertex with the smallest distance is 9, is 2, sorry, with the distance of 9. So we're going to remove 2 from the vset. Okay, so now we have four edges to consider, right? But remember that we can ignore the edge going back to 0 and the edge going to 3 because... We've already explored these. All right, so let's look at this edge here from two to one. Okay, so if we relax along this edge, right now the, the cost of the path from the starting vertex to one is going to be the distance to two plus four, right, which is the weight of the edge. So nine plus four, that's going to be 13. And that's more than the current shortest known path, right, which is 14. So we're going to update our distance array. So, so the distance array, so the new distance is going to be 13, and the new predecessor is going to be 2. Okay. Cool. Okay, next edge. So remember, we don't need to consider this edge because we've already explored 3. So let's move on to the next edge. So now we want to relax along with this edge from 2 to 5, right? So if we relax along this edge, then the new cost to 5 is going to be what? So it's going to be 9 from the distance array, right? So the distance to 2 plus 3, right? Which is going to be 12. Right now, since 12 is more than 22, which is the current shortest known path, um, we're going to update our distance array. Right, so the new distance is going to be 12, and the new predecessor is going to be 2. Okay. And now we're done with 2. Okay, so which vertex do we remove next? Well, we have a choice between 1, 4, and 5. Right? And 5 is the one with the smaller distance. All right, so let's remove 5 from the VSAT. All right, now we want to explore these edges, but we don't need to consider two and three, right? Because we've already explored these. So we just relax along this edge from five to four. All right, so what's the distance to four going to be if we use this edge? Well, what we're going to do is, again, we're going to take the shortest distance to five, which is 12, and we're going to add the weight of the edge from five to four. Right, so 12 plus 8 is 20. And since 20 is smaller than infinity, we're going to update our array so that the distance is now 20 and the predecessor is 5. Okay, so now we're done with exploring 5. Right, next vertex to remove is going to be 1 or 4. So 1 has a distance of 13, so let's remove that. Okay, so one has three neighbors, but remember we can ignore zero and two because we've explored those. 
All right, so all we want to do is relax along this edge over here from one to four. So, so what's the cost of four going to be if we use this edge? Um, so it's going to be 13 from the distance array plus five. So 13 plus 5 is going to be 18, right? Now, 18 is smaller than 20, right? Which is our current shortest distance to 4. So what do we do? We update our distance to 18, and we update the predecessor to 1, okay? So that's it for vertex 1. And now there's only one vertex left to remove. Right, so we're going to remove vertex 4 from the V sets. And since both of its neighbors have already been explored, we don't need to consider either of them. Okay, so we ignore 1 and we ignore 5, and we're done with the algorithm. Okay, so here are our distances, right? So this is the shortest distance from 0 to each vertex, right? And these are the predecessors of each vertex. And this is going to allow us to reconstruct the shortest path from zero to all the other vertices. Right, so similar to BFS and DFS. Right, so here's the kind of uh, fast forward through the algorithm. Right, so this is after the first iteration, after the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Right, and here is the final result. Right, so the bolded edges um, over here show us which edges are on the shortest paths. Right, so the shortest path from 0 to 5 is going to be 0 to 5. Shortest path to 4 is going to be 0 to 1, 4, and so on. OK, so now that we've finished running Dijkstra's algorithm, how do we actually find the shortest path? Uh, so I already alluded to this earlier, but we use the predecessor array. Right, so we're going to trace backwards through the predecessor array, um, like for BFS or DFS. All right, so suppose we're, so here's our predecessor array that we got from before, and here's um, an example. So we want to find the shortest path from 0 to 4. OK, so how do we do it? Well, we just backtrack through the predecessor array. All right, so four, the predecessor of four is one. So that means there's a one on the shortest path just before four. Now the predecessor of one is gonna be two. All right, so the vertex just before one is two. And then the predecessor of two is zero. All right, so the predecessor, and, and zero is where we started. All right, so that tells us that the shortest path is 0, 2, 1, 4. Okay, and the thing with Dijkstra's algorithm is that it does only tell us the shortest path from the starting vertex, the vertex that you chose, to every other vertex. So if you want to find the shortest path between two other vertices, you will likely need to rerun the algorithm. Right. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to find the shortest path between, for example, three to one, right, then you'll probably need to rerun Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, but um, there are still a couple of extra distances that you can deduce from this result. So, for example, you know, here are the paths, right, starting from vertex zero to all the other vertices, right? Now, since the shortest path from 0 to 4 is 0 to 1, 4, right, then we know for sure that the shortest path from 2 to 4 is going to be 2, 1, 4. Right? So it has to be, because if there was a shorter path from 2 to 4, then you know, there would be a shorter path from 0 to 4. Right? Um, so you can kind of deduce a couple more distances from starting from a particular vertex. Right, there's also a question in the chat, which is, is that considered a minimum spanning tree? Um, so not necessarily. Um, in this case, it might be a minimum spanning tree. But in general, uh, you can't use Dijkstra's algorithm to give you a minimum spanning tree. 
but we'll look at minimum spanning trees in the next lecture. So don't worry. So there are other algorithms for computing that. Okay, so that is Dijkstra's algorithm. And there are a couple of other things that we need to talk about, which is how do you actually implement the visited uh, sets or the vertex sets, right? So at the beginning, we need to keep track of the set of vertices that we haven't explored yet, right? So how do we actually implement this? Because we sort of, you know, a set is a kind of abstract thing. So how do we actually implement it? Turns out we can implement it in a bunch of different ways. Right, so for example, we can implement it using a visited array, right? So this is just going to be an array of Booleans, true and false, where every time we explore a vertex, we're going to just mark it as visited in a visited array. Right, so the way we implement this actually will affect the time complexity of our solution, right? So if we just implement it in this simple way, then remember that every time we remove a vertex from the V-set, we're going to have to find the one with the smallest distance, right? So that means we're going to have to loop through this array. And you know, for each vertex, we're going to check if it's already been visited yet. And if it hasn't, then we're going to check its distance, right? So we're going to loop through the entire array. That means every time we want to remove a vertex from the V-set, it's going to be O of V, right? right? Another way of implementing it is to use an explicit array or list of vertices, right? So maybe at the beginning of the algorithm, we store all of the vertices in a linked list, right? And at the beginning of each iteration, we're going to loop through this list and find the one with the smallest distance. And once we find this vertex, we're going to just remove it from the list, right? So this approach is also big O of V, right? Because again, we have to loop through the list. Okay, another way of implementing it is to use something called a priority queue, right? And a priority queue is itself an ADT. And it's something that we're going to look at in week nine, uh, but just here are just some, you know, here's just an overview of how it will be used. So a priority queue is an ADT where we have items and each item has a priority, right? So a priority value, okay? And the way the priority queue works is that every time we remove something from the priority queue, it's going to remove the item with the highest priority, right? So the way we would use a priority queue in Dijkstra's algorithm is we use it to store the vertices, right? And the priorities is going to be, are going to be the distance, right? So the priority of each vertex is just going to be the distance to that vertex, right? Where the smaller the distance is, the higher the priority is. So a good priority queue implementation has log n, insert, and delete. Right? So every time we delete from the priority queue, it's going to be log n. Right? So that's much better than the O of V um, of these simple implementations. So if you use a priority queue, you can get much more efficient. Right? So you can much more efficiently figure out which vertex to remove from the V set. Okay, so yeah, those are three ways of implementing the V set. So what we're going to talk about now is just an analysis of Dijkstra's algorithm, right? And the first thing before we actually talk about the time complexity, I want to go through a, a quick proof of why Dijkstra's algorithm works. Right, because this might be the first, or one of the first algorithms where it's not obvious why it actually works. Um, you know, how do you actually know the algorithm gives you the shortest path? Um, so 
One way to show that it actually works is to use something called induction, right? Um, and this isn't like mathematical induction. It's kind of an induction in algorithms where you, know, you have some invariance and you want to show that the invariant holds at each stage of the algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to prove that before and after each iteration of the algorithm, right, if a vertex has been explored, so for every explored node S, right, by the way, you don't need to like type this down. This You don't have to memorize this proof. We're not going to uh, examine it or anything. This is just something I wanted to show you. Um, but for all explored nodes S, we're going to show that the distance array is going to contain the shortest distance from the starting vertex to S. Right? And we're also going to show that for all unexplored nodes, T, right, distance T is going to be the shortest distance from the starting vertex to T via explored nodes only. Okay? So, so the idea is to prove this, uh, these two things before and after each iteration. And since at the end of the algorithm, we're going to have explored all the nodes, um, that means that by this first statement over here, uh, for all nodes, the distance array is going to contain the shortest distance to that node. All right, so first of all, the base case is at the start of the first iteration. Right now, we know that both statements are going to hold. Right, So the first statement holds because there aren't any explored vertices. Right, And the second statement holds because at the beginning, you know, the shortest distance is infinity right, to every vertex, except for the starting vertex, right, because we haven't actually explored any nodes yet. Okay, so, so that's the base case. So the base case we know is true, right? But the inductive step is the kind of tricky part, right? So here is where we're going to make our inductive hypothesis, right? So we're going to assume that both of these statements hold at the start of the iteration, right? So for all explored nodes, the distance array contains the shortest distance to that vertex. And for all unexplored nodes, the distance array contains the shortest path to that node via explored nodes only. Right? So here's our example. So suppose that these are the explored nodes and these are the unexplored nodes. Right? I'm going to assume that the two statements hold at the start. Right? So for these four nodes, the distance array contains the shortest distance to that vertex. And for these nodes, the distance array contains the shortest distance via explored nodes only, All right? So now, let this node over here be the unexplored node with the minimum distance, All right? So out of all of the unexplored nodes, this is the one with the smallest distance. And we're going to claim that this, uh, that the distance array contains the shortest distance to this node, right, to S. Okay, so for example, suppose that this is the shortest path to S. Right, so why is this the case? Um, well, so we're supposing here that this is the shortest path to S, right, so if there was a shorter path to S, via explored nodes, so for example, if this path was shorter, then we would have updated the distance to S while we were exploring this vertex, right? So, so that can't happen, right? So distance S is the shortest distance from the starting vertex to S. But also, if there is a shorter path to S via an unexplored node, so if there was a path that was shorter, for example, this path over here, right? Then, well, that means that the path to this node is smaller than the path to this node, right? Because 
this path does go through this unexplored node. Right? And this is a contradiction because we already supposed that this node has the minimum distance out of all of the unexplored nodes. Right? So that's a contradiction. So we know that this, uh, so that if this vertex here has the minimum distance, right, then the distance array does contain the shortest distance to S. Okay, so, yep, so now we know that this, um, so this, for this vertex here, this, the distance array contains the shortest distance to this vertex, right? And after we explore the vertex, right, so after we explore the vertex, we wanna show that the two statements are still true, right? So, first of all, the first statement, which is that all of the distances, so for all explored vertices, the distance array contains the shortest distance to that vertex. Right now, that statement still holds for S, right? Because we never updated the distance while exploring S, right? So, we're looking at all the neighbors of S, but we never update the distance to S itself. Okay, so, and the same is true for the other explored nodes, right? So we don't update the distance to these nodes while exploring S. Right now, the second statement also still holds for all of the unexplored nodes, so these nodes over here, right? And that's because if there is a shorter path, so suppose like this, before exploring S, this was the shortest path to this node over here, right? Now, if while exploring S, we did find a shorter path to this node, suppose, you know, via this path over here, right? Then we would update the distance to this node while exploring S, right? So the second statement still holds. And if this path, this dotted path of here is not shorter than this solid path, then we wouldn't update the distance. So that's kind of the proof of why Dijkstra's algorithm works. So, you know, can be a little wordy, so don't worry if uh, you don't really fully understand it. Um, but this is just to show you an example of how some algorithms can be proven. Okay, so now, um, how about the time complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm? Right, so, so we kind of have to break this algorithm up into different pieces and analyze each of them separately. Right, so the first, um, so let's go over to the pseudocode. Right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this for loop over here and analyze it on its own, right? Then we're gonna take this, like these two lines over here where we find the vertex with the smallest distance and also analyze this on its own. Okay, so, oops. So first of all, what we're doing during the algorithm is we're relaxing along each edge once, right? Exactly once. So the contribution of this part of the algorithm to our time complexity is O of E, right? Because we're considering each edge once, right? Now, the other parts of the algorithm is the part where we find the vertex with the minimum distance and remove it from the VSAT, right? So remember, we did this at the start of every iteration. Okay, so since the outer loop has V iterations, right, every iteration we have to loop through and find the vertex with the smallest distance, right? So this depends on how we implement the vertex set, right? So if we use a Boolean array, which was the first method that we talked about, um, then the time complexity is gonna be O of V per iteration, right? because every iteration, you loop through the array, right, and you find which one has the smallest distance out of the vertices that haven't been explored yet. 
Right, so that means the overall cost is going to be e plus v squared, right? So that's going to be O of v squared overall, right? Okay, so the second method was where we have an array or linked list of vertices that we haven't visited yet, right? Every iteration we find the one with the smallest distance and remove it, right? And this is also O of V per iteration, right? So the overall cost is also going to be O of V squared, right? And the reason E plus V squared simplifies the V squared is because V squared is always going to be greater than the number of edges, right? Greater than or equal to. Okay, the last method is where we use a priority queue, right? Now, we haven't covered priority queues in detail yet, but we will in week nine. Uh, but this is going to uh, be log v per iteration, because removing from a priority queue is log v, right? and also adding. Uh, but removing is going to be log v. So that means since we have v iterations, the cost of that is going to be v log v. Right? And adding on e from needing to consider every edge during the algorithm, the overall cost is going to be e plus v log v. Okay, so if you use a priority queue, then that's going to give you the best time complexity. All right. So again, we'll look at priority queues in more detail in week nine. Okay, so that's Dijkstra's algorithm. Now, there are other shortest path algorithms that you can look at if you're curious. Um, some of these are covered in later courses, um, but the main ones are floyd warshaw algorithm. So this lets you find the shortest path between every possible pair of vertices. Um, and there's also an algorithm called the bellman ford algorithm. Um, and in particular, these graphs actually work with graphs that have negative weights, right? whereas Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't work. Um, but, but you know, there you go. All right, so there is, so that's it for Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, so again, if you have any feedback, uh, please feel free to share. Um, otherwise. Um, our next topic is going to be minimum spanning trees, and that's going to wrap up our topic of graphs. So we'll cover that on Thursday. And again, the assignment is going to be released later today, maybe an hour from now. Okay, so, and yeah, with the assignments, the knowledge that you need um, is just up to this lecture, all right? So you don't need the content from Thursday's lecture, just today. And also previous lectures as well. But yeah, so that's it. So I'll see you guys on Thursday then for minimum spanning trees. And we'll also talk a bit about the assignment. Okay.